Well, one of the greatest things we will ever have is that our point of need, there will be somebody there to watch over, to encourage, to strengthen, to help us. And our call in life is to be there for others when they're in trouble and they need us to be there for them. It's one of the things that God has asked us to do. Now, you know, it's interesting when I, when I look at what God, the things that God has asked us to do, how many of them are counterintuitive? In other words, forgiving the people that sin against us doesn't seem real smart. Most of us go, you know, if I, if I forgive everybody that, that, that sins against me, I'm just going to be a doormat, right? You know? And yet what we find out, if we do life long enough, is we figure out that when we are able, when we don't forgive people, it becomes a cancer that ends up hurting us more than it does anybody else. And when we do forgive, when we allow God to do something powerful in our life to enable us to forgive, at that very moment, we find health. You know, it's interesting. In fact, everything, I believe that everything that God commands us to do, He commands us to do because it's what makes us healthy. Just kind of like, you know, and, and I'm thankful that, you know, that we have a whole lot of uh, food processing these days and, and different areas to where uh, pork, man, I love me some pork. Oh, man, baby back ribs and bacon and man I'm, I'm glad we finally gotten to the place to where we can make pork safe to where you know it doesn't you know make us si deathly sick now I know that a lot of that fat doesn't make me happy but I mean make me healthy but it does make me happy right you know and so but here's the thing if we were to truly eat according to the kosher laws that God laid out all of us would be healthier today we just would I mean you know now, that doesn't mean we're all going to fall over and die if we don't keep the kosher laws. But if we did, we would be healthier. In fact, I believe that for everything that God commands us to do. I believe everything that God commands us to do, He commands us to do it because it is life and health in our, in our world. Even though, at times, we look at that and go, well, I don't know, right? You know, over and over again, I believe it's there. And today, we're going to look at one that is the same, which is we first started this series off by asking the right questions, going, am, am I asking the kind of questions that are going to help me to make good decisions in my family, in my workplace, uh, in, in my school, in every area of life? And then we talked about exploring the possibilities. What am I really capable of? I mean, if God has given me all this talent and all this gift, most of us live, I believe, below our potential. We argue ourselves out of the best because we're afraid of failure, you know, it's going to be, take too much work, it's going to be too, you know, difficult, I don't get the options, you know, I've, I've wasted too much time, whatever in the world that may be. Today we're talking about changing our world. And here's one of the things that I propose and has been wonderful as I have looked at it. I've always known, the Bible says, it is, Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And all of us that hold the Bible as having some authority in our life go, yep, Jesus said that. But do we really believe that? I mean, seriously. Do we really believe it's more blessed to give than receive? Because I love me some receiving. I am telling you, there's nobody in the world likes getting stuff more than me, right? You know, I mean, I like that, you know. And, you know, it was, it was, we had a garage sale yesterday, and, and Jennifer's working with her kids, right? You know, and little Parker and Kyle uh, are out there, and, and Jen goes, okay, well, here's the deal, right? You know, here's your money, and this goes into savings, and this is your tithe to the church, and this is what you have left over, right? You know, and they're, okay, right? You know, and they're, you know, I mean, when you begin to look at what it's going to take to be healthy, with my finances or anything else, most of the time it's not really what I want to do, is it? Because at the bottom line, we're all kind of selfish. I mean, you know, I think one of the first words my kids learned was, mine! And they said it loud, often, and with great passion. You know, I never once heard, you know, I never once heard my kid go, I want to share more, Dad, and they won't let me. Right, you know? <laughs> No, we had sharing lessons at my house. We are going to share, and get, right? Because <laughs> there's something about us that goes, if I give away my stuff, other people get it, right? I mean, you know, 
American policy is get all you can, can all you get, and sit on the can, right? You know, don't be giving it away to nobody else. I work hard for all this, all right? Is it possible that God commands us to have an impact in the world because it's not just good for the world, but it's actually health and life for us? Let's take a little journey here this morning. First thing we're going to talk about, uh, if you're not real familiar with the Bible, if you're here just exploring and uh, kind of checking things out a little bit, uh, the Bible uses uh, a lot of uh, allusions and metaphors, and one of them is uh, in uh, John 10, there's lots and lots of places, but in John 10 is probably the, the most profound thing that Jesus said when he said, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now, in their day, this was a very powerful illustration. First of all, because sheep were one of the most valuable animals that you could have. Because not only did it provide food for your family, but it also provided for all their clothing. The wool uh, is where they got the, you know, the material and were able to spend to get fabric and to do almost everything that they needed. So sheep were very precious to them uh, because they not only provided food, but also provided clothing. And they were also precious in the fact that they are very much defenseless. They can't take care of themselves. So, I mean, you can have a herd of cattle and you can just kind of, you know, let them roam out there and, you know, put a little herding, you know, I mean, a little fence around them. They're, full, they're fine. Sheep, not so much. I mean, they're victim to everything. I mean, you know, they're bas it, when it comes down to wild animal predators, they're at the bottom of the list. I mean, you know, you never see a, a sheep attack happening, you know, anywhere, right? You know? So... They're vulnerable to begin with, and the second thing is, I mean, they can't even go get a drink by themselves, because if they go down to where there's moving water, and they get in to get a drink, and their wool gets heavy, they literally don't even have enough body strength to lift themselves back out of the stream. So the shepherd had to go scoop water and put it somewhere where it was safe, so they basically had to be watched over all the time. Now, I don't know why in the world God would use that as an illustration for what he has to do with us. But I believe it's because we're valuable, and yet at the same time, we're kind of high maintenance, okay? So, but he says that I am a good shepherd. I really care for my sheep, and I would lay down my life for my sheep. So he uses this illustration of, this, uh, of sheep. I want to read in Matthew 25, 31, the command that Jesus gives in very, very stark terms. He says this, When the Son of Man, speaking of himself, comes in glory... And all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. And all the nations will gather before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, the sheep, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you, since the creation of the world. And why do we get this? Verse 35, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And all the sheep went, huh? When the What? It says, then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And, and, and when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes or, and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. But then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will also say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison, and we didn't help you? And he replied, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do to me. Now, here's the thing. Both groups would have eagerly done anything for Jesus, right? 
Just like me. I mean, man, if Jesus asked me to do something, I mean, you know, if he was literally here and said do this, I'd do it in a heartbeat. I mean, I'm a very blessed man because one of the, the, the great blessings of being the pastor here at God Wise, I could call almost any of you all at any point and go, I'm really in trouble. Could you help me out? Man, you all drop everything and come help me out because of the relationship. You know, I mean, most of us don't have any trouble helping out someone that we have great respect for, you know, someone that we like or someone that's a good friend or, you know, those kind of things unless they ask you to help move. <laughs> We've all learned about that one, haven't we? <laughs> you got a truck, it's broke, <laughs> right? But most of us on most occasions, right, you know, I mean, you know, if, if there's some way that we can help, we would want to do that. I mean, you know, why? Because of that relationship. But Jesus says, you didn't do it for me when you didn't do it for one of the least of these. And why? Because we are all God's children. And the thing that we miss is most of us would be more than happy to do something for Jesus, but we're as clueless as the people at the table over here as the fact that all of those Jesuses are walking around us the whole time we're having this conversation about this great thing we're going to do at our church. And I'm telling you, I am, you know, when they talk about sheep not being real bright, I, I can relate. Because there are times that it should be painfully obvious, and it's not. It's just painful. And I realize that what is going on is I miss the heart of God so many times. Because I'm either too busy, or too ignorant, <laughs> or too jaded. That's the other problem in America. We live in a place that overall is very affluent. And it's very easy for us to look at someone in the third world that lives in abject poverty and go, we ought to help there. But we look around at some of the folks in our uh, uh, social system. And it's easy to find the people that are trying to abuse the system that are unhealthy. But many times we become jaded and we miss the people that truly need help. We become too busy. We become too diverted. And I believe we lose the heart of God. But it's worse than that. We lose health. We lose life. We lose purpose. We lose the things that make life the absolute best. Because most of us love God. You know, and if you're here and you're, you're still seeking or searching and you, and you haven't come to that place yet, I understand. But for those of us who have crossed the line of faith, we say we love God. And I did a Christmas message one time called, What Do You Give a God That's Got Everything? Man, I mean, talking about somebody it's hard to buy for, right? You know? What, what do you give God if, if he basically has everything? And I found this verse, and I want to read it to you real quick. In John 21, 14, Jesus is about to speak the last recorded words we have of him on the face of the earth. He spoke them to Peter. And what he said to Peter were the last words he was ever going to speak with Peter. Now, as a pastor, I have an opportunity on many occasions to be with people in the last hours of their life, whether it be in hospice care or in a hospital or sometimes in a home. I've never had a person in the last hours of their life pull their children together and go, I just wish I had had a faster car. You know, I, w I, w I really, really wish I had spent more hours at the office. The things that we say when we know they are the last words that we will ever speak to someone that we love are the most important things that we will ever speak in our life. And Jesus knew that this was the last thing he would ever say to Peter. And I think we have to assume it's the most important thing. And so we read. Now this was now the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Speaking of all the fish that they had caught, because he was a fisherman. Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. And then again Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. 
And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And a third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. I have these kind of conversations all the time at my house. Paul says to me, John, I put some paperwork on top of your briefcase. I need you to call and make arrangements for X, Y, or Z. And I go, okay. And a couple of moments later, as she's packing up her stuff, she goes, now, John, I put that paperwork on top of your briefcase. I need you to make sure that you get that taken care of. Yeah, baby, got it. She's about to go out the door, and she'll go, John, I know, I know, I know, the paperwork on the briefcase. I get offended just like Peter did, right? Five o'clock in the afternoon, she goes, did you get that? Oh, God, you know, sorry, I meant to do that. Oh, God, I hate it when that happens, right? I believe the reason Jesus was so emphatic is it's easy to say yes. But this was something that was more important than anything else that Jesus had to say to Peter. He didn't ask us to build him a cathedral. He didn't ask us to have worship services three times a week, honoring and venerating his name. When he pulled Peter together, he didn't say, write books about me. When he pulled Peter close, and the last things that he would ever say to him, he goes, if you love me, this is the one thing I want you to know expresses that love more powerfully and more clearly than anything else you will do. Take care of my sheep. Watch over my lambs. If you want to show you love me, do this. As we begin to look at what James says, in James 2.14, he goes, What good is it, my brothers, if we claim to have faith but we have no action, no deeds? Could such faith save us? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothing or daily food, and we say to him, Go, keep well, warm, and well fed, but do nothing about his physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by actions, is dead. Now here's the thing. Not a one of us in this place can meet all the need that is going to arise in your life. I mean, you know, we, we can't meet every need that's out there. And the thing is, Jesus didn't meet every need that was out there. He healed a bunch of people, but he didn't heal every sick person. You know? There were times that, you know, I find this interesting that the disciples come and find Jesus, and they go, Jesus, there's a, ma there's a multitude of people waiting to hear you speak. And he goes, not today. <laughs> I'm going over the other side of the lake, right? You know, even Jesus did not meet every need that somebody threw in front of him, but he met a lot of them. And we can never go, well, I can't do everything, and use that as an excuse to do practically nothing. And the reason is because our greatest health and our greatest life is when we do what God has asked us to do. When we make a difference in someone's life. And I've learned that I don't have to meet, not, not only am I not expected to meet every need, but I'm not expected to meet all the needs all the way. Sometimes I team with other people. Sometimes, you know, we, we get certain people that work as a group. Or, you know, but together, we're supposed to go, I have been blessed so that I can be a blessing. And the reason that we do it is for life change. You know, it's interesting, uh, I, I, this, I'm, I've got to get... Jennifer's grandmother to quilt this on a pillow, I mean, uh, cross this, this on a pillow for me. But one of the things I say over and over and over again, especially in America, where we have a lot of people that are, are in the situation that they are in because of continual dysfunctional behavior that keeps putting them back there. And I, I say this all the time, I will do almost anything that I possibly can to help you move forward and get healthier, but I am not going to do anything to make it comfortable for you to stay stuck. 
And we really have to get there. I mean, at some point you go, you know, if you have no desire to get healthier or to do something positive, I'm not just going to make you comfortable where you are. But if you have any desire to move forward and get healthy, I want to be a part of supporting and encouraging and, and making it possible for that to happen. And so I uh, put this down. I said, charity without life change produces dependence on sources outside for health. But aid that brings a message of life change empowers people and provides the opportunity to rise above their circumstances. In fact, when I was in seminary, we learned a, a, a term called redemption and lift. And what that means is that when a church does what God has asked a church to do, which is actually create a place for people to find life change and help and aid them in that change, they actually change. And one of the greatest things about being here at God Why is the fact that we don't minister in, in, in large amount to all the rich, the popular, and the beautiful. You know, I mean, we're, we're a scraggly mess at certain edges, you know? <laughs> we didn't fit neatly into all the other churches necessarily, right? You know, and, and so, you know, we, we, you know, we don't, you know, we, we don't have a parking lot that's filled, you know, with uh, all, you know, exotic sports cars out there, you know. We, we kind of all got here and, you know, the stuff that, you know, we owe the bank for, right? You know, and so, we're, you know, we, we don't have, you know, tremendous resources, but what we have is tremendous life change. And what Redemption and Lift talks about is the process by which a person finds the Lord. And in finding the Lord, they start to address their addictions and their struggles and their habits they start to look for a healthier life for themselves. And what ends up happening, as they get healthier, their children in the next generation step up a socioeconomic step. And their children from that healthier place by the second generation, the, the area where they lived and the society they came from, their grandchildren live completely outside of it in the burbs. And they said it's redemption and lift. What happens is the first generation finds the Lord and starts to get healthier. Their kids are healthier still. Their kids are even more advantaged and healthier still. And what generally happens is the community they went in that was a low-rent community, the, the, the kids down there are all moved out to the burbs and the church dies because there's nobody left in it because they all got upwardly mobile. And a new church has to go in and start with the next group and, and they end up going up and they disappear and then a new church has to come back in. Now what would be great is if one church could continue ministering to both ends. But here's what happens. And this is kind of a problem. First generation money people aren't very giving. Many of us that, that started out hard in our lives, and in my generation, I'm the back end of the baby boomers. I'm actually old enough to get in that category. We all wanted to be yuppies and dinks and drive BMWs. and, you know, and, and you know, there, there wasn't this real, you know, we need to minister to the community kind of thing, right? You know, it's like, you know, we're going to get all we can, can't all we can, sit on can, right? You know, so we're, 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 we're trying to do better for ourselves. But What's really interesting is generally the generation behind that tends to be a whole lot more socially aware because they learn that being a latchkey kids with two working parents doing everything they can to make a lot of money didn't necessarily bring a lot of happiness. A lot of toys, a lot of diversion, but not necessarily a lot of purpose and a lot of direction. And we see the 20-somethings and many of them being way more concerned about the poor and the oppressed than their yuppie and dink parents ever did because second generation and third generation they figure it out you know I, I ministered at church in, in Brentwood at one point and man everybody was trying to you know be upwardly mobile but I'd run into people from Bell Mead from old money and you couldn't tell them from people that didn't have any money right you know I mean you know they're just kind of like man money what the heck right and ruin my you know my entire family I don't care less about it you know, why? Because they've been there long enough to go, money won't make you happy. Give you a lot of toys, and in the long run, it creates shallow, superficial lives that don't really matter. And they end up resorting back and going, I don't want more things. I'm thinged out. What I want is something that actually matters, some purpose. And so we have to figure out where we are in this. And as I begin to, uh, altruism, this is the definition it is an unselfish concern for the welfare of others. 
It is a generous way of expressing gratitude for all that you have been given. And so I, I googled the word altruism because I wanted to find some articles on altruism. And the very first thing that I found was a term that I'd never heard of before, and it's the helper's high. The helper's high. I'd never heard this word before. And so I read it, and so I googled the helper's high, and man, just article after article after article started showing up. And what is happening is there is a whole new research study going on in the scientific community doing research on the euphoria and health that comes from helping other people in a very unselfish way, just to give into other people's lives. Stephen G. Post, Ph.D., professor of bioethics at Western Reserve University Medical uh, School, writes in his new book, Why Good Things Happen to Good People. He says, the helper's high has been measured physically. We know there's actual physiological state. It is quite euphoric. And the helper's high shows up on MRI brain scans. People who give money show brain activity that associates the same chemicals of, uh, of dopamine as the brain of someone who receives money. It's more blessed to give than receives money. Yes. CBS in their TV show 2020 had a whole uh, episode on the helper side. It said the National Institute for Health Neuroscience, Jordan Gaffman, showed us the brain scans. Those brain structures that are activated when you get a reward are the very ones that are activated when, some, when you give. In fact, they're activated more, he told us. We ask our volunteers after their week of service, they, they sent a whole team out to do this, who they believe got more out of the experience, them or the people they helped? And the overwhelming answer was, he, was uh, heralded along with uh, uh, Daniel Smith, who said, no brainer, we definitely got more. John Hopkins Medical Magazine recently detailed the works of Alan Lurks, who in a study of the Helper's High, uh, who has been studying the Helper's High for quite some time, he described the effects as being similar to a runner's high after a workout. There is a release of endorphins uh, in the giver's body that lead to a feeling of elation followed by a feeling of calm. But unlike exercise, there's evidence that the helper can experience this high over and over again by just recalling the charitable acts even long after they have finished. Lurk's research showed that of the 95% of the study participants who felt that helper's high, 9 out of 10 uh, graded their health condition better than those who were not experiencing a helper's high. And this lead Luke's to, the, to postulate the volunteers and those giving ease stress in their body, the possibility of strengthening their immune system activity, decreasing their uh, awareness of uh, both physical and mental pain, the activation of emotions that gave them the ability to maintain good health, the reduction of incidents of attitude of chronic hostility and negative arousal, uh, uh, negativity, arising from uh, damage to the body. The multiple benefits of the body system provide stress relief in every area. Which brings me back to my opening statement. When we do what God tells us to do, we get healthier. And I love it when science begins to look and go, if we began to understand what the Bible told us 2,000 years ago, that it is more blessing for us to give than it is to receive. When we help someone else, the positive benefits, both with stress, with the sense of self-worth and everything else, is actually in our brain when they do an MRI, we have more dopamine and more health come into our life when we help someone else than when we do it ourselves. One more time where I go, well, son of a gun. Evidently, God knows what he's doing, right? Because when we hear that it's more blessed to forgive than receive, we don't get it. And yet now we have science actually doing brain scans with MRIs and going, we see more dopamine and more endorphins rushing when someone actually helps someone else than when they actually receive the same thing for themselves. Now I share that 
Because I want us to be vibrant and alive and healthy in every area, man. And the more that I study the Word of God and the more that I look at research and the more, it is amazing how over and over again it continues to be confirmed. When we do what God asks us to do, we get healthier. But it's hard. We live in America, for crying out loud. And there is every diversion, there is every toy, there is every uh, you know, opportunity to just be like the liar's table, to let opportunity roam past us over and over and over again. And the only way that changes is to get our eyes open. And, and I hate to, to, to go to hedonism, but if it works, right, why not? No. You'll be healthier if you do it, right? And yet, do we believe that? Do we believe when we truly love and sacrifice? You know, I mean, you know, it, it's interesting, you know, with the crew that we attract, I get to go visit people in prison and uh, in jail occasionally, uh, a little more than occasionally. But, uh, you know, and, and it used to be you got to see people in person. Now, you know, you got to use the, the video system uh, to be in there. But, you know, there's never a time that I go and spend a little time with someone that is uh, doing some jail time that I don't come out way more thankful in my own heart and in my own life for all the blessing that God has given me. And when you look at someone's eyes and they think someone cared enough to come and spend some time, you know, and, 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 you know, and, and, and to take the time to write and just go, you know, that you remembered me. Because I feel like such a failure. I feel like everything that I have done has made me so unhealthy that no one wants to be around me. And I go, it does as much for me as it does for them. I become encouraged. Every time that we reach out, we also receive back. Do we want a life that is full and rich with less stress and more satisfaction? We've got to do what God asks us to do. And one of those things that does it powerfully is when we don't just live for ourselves. There's a couple of things that I want to put out to you here real quick. First one is this. We as a church are not going to diminish anything to, our, to the best of our power that we do inside the church, but all those footprints out there on that wall, are we're, we're starting something for this next year, and it's actually starting this Sunday and kind of moving forward, but Easter we're going to really kick it in, and that is we want to be more outside the church than just inside the church. We really, really want to take these kind of passages serious. And so the first thing that we're doing uh, is a, a little campaign called The Church Has Left the Building. And uh, what we're going to do is two Wednesday nights, not this coming Wednesday night, but on the 12th, two weeks out, we are going to throw a block party for uh, the uh, Section 8 housing community in Gallatin that is right around the Shalom Zone. The Shalom Zone is uh, a, uh, a cooperative of ministries that help the poor uh, in the Gallatin area and people that are, are struggling financially and also in other ways. And what we're going to do is we're going to go on their property out there. We're going to throw a block party for all the kids in the community. We're going to serve hot dogs. We're going to play games. We're going to have, uh, Lord willing, uh, we're, we're looking for some people to help us uh, to be able to provide some big blow-up stuff to just do a great big party for the kids of the neighborhood that surround the Shalom Zone just to go, you're valuable. And we, we just want to bless your lives and let you know that the Shalom Zone is here to be an aid to your family because they provide all types of training and, and different types of things to bless families. And so, uh, so we're inviting anyone that wants to go with us. We're, we've got a, a crew, my 19-guy men's group is all excited. They're all carpooling and ready to go uh, get that thing done. But anybody that wants to go out there, we have a sign-up sheet right next to the water fountains uh, by the big bucket that says the church has left the building. So if you want to be a part, we need people to cook. We need people to play games. We've got people that are doing face painting and fingernail painting. We've got a guy that's going to do balloon animals. You know, this is going to be a big party. Now, the time is from 5 to 8. And I realize that some people work downtown, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little challenge. If you want to be a part of this, ask your, ask your boss. Say, would it be possible for me to get off just a little bit early on Wednesday the 12th? My ch I want to be a part of what my church is doing to uh, uh, do
do a party for some kids that are, are in low-income housing in the Gallatin area. I would imagine some bosses will let you offer that. They, they will give you the opportunity to be a part of this. And it will also be uh, a nice little uh, awareness thing, you know, for them too, that people are actually doing something. You know, and there's lots of people doing a lot of things all over the place. But uh, it's always good when you see that kind of thing. So if you have a heart to put what we're talking about today into practice, we're going to do that. Now, Easter, last year, we did 100% for 100 days. And it was one of the most successful things that we have done in a while to get people to get in good relationships, to find health, and to look for life change. This coming Easter, we're doing 100 acts of service in 100 days. And what we're going to do is for 100 days, we're going to do something different every single day. And we'll have it out on Facebook. We'll have it on the website. Some of it's going to be very small. Write someone a note of encouragement, you know. Uh, uh, one of the other things, you know, will be, uh, you know, uh, buy someone lunch and, and just encourage them. You know, little things like that. But we'll also have a couple of big projects like this during that 100 days. But to get us back in a mentality to where we go every day is an opportunity to do what Jesus asked us to do which is to make a difference. And you don't have to wait for Easter to do that, but it's going to be a big rally point for us over this next year to go, we want to get the church out of the building as well as inviting people to come into the building. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I want to be one of the people that stands up. Lord, I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. I want to know that I did the things that truly express love to you, the things that you've asked us to do that really show that we have your heart, which is to love and care for those that are in need. And so, Father, we ask that as, as we corporately as a congregation and individually begin to step up in those areas of not just doing great things within these four walls, but doing great things outside, that, Lord, you will empower us to that end, that, Lord, we will gain an even deeper understanding of your love and your mercy, both for others and for ourselves. Lord, that you will grow us into fulfilling your heart in this world. And so, Father, we just thank you that as uh, each one of us just open our eyes and, and use our gifts in whatever way that you would lead us, that, Lord, you will be honored, we will be changed, and the world will be touched. We ask for you to do that in and through us. In Jesus' name, amen.